Hello, and welcome back to the LagCast. It is August 31st, 2018, and I guess I just need to start with a quick apology to the listeners. We've gone a little bit radio silent for the last few weeks. Some uh, unforeseen things came up in our lives that uh, prevented us from being able to actually sit down and record and talk to you fine folks. But uh, we are back. Um, with me, as always, is uh, my co-host, Sam Richard. Hey. Uh, Will Henry will not be joining us on this episode, and uh, perhaps not for several in the foreseeable future. He's taking a leave of absence from the podcast, and he will be missed. Yep, yep very much so. Um, we still have him on technical support, luckily, but uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're not going to hear his fine voice uh, tonight or uh, in the near future, it seems. Anyway, moving on, um, I guess before we start, we should talk a little bit about how we're going to be changing up the format a little bit. Yeah, uh, that's a good idea. Yeah, why don't you do a go into it a little bit, Sam. Okay. So I don't remember everything we decided <laughs> to do, but I know for one thing, we aren't going to be so f- much focused on like the general news of the things that we're talking about usually. Right. Uh, we want to change our focus a little bit more to uh, the things that we're really interested in and uh, get maybe a little more uh, in-depth into those things. Yeah, I'd say that, especially with the comics in particular, uh, having a little bit more time to uh, get into some of the nitty gritty of why we really like or dislike the particular issues will be, uh, it'll be nice. Um, And we figure you guys, you probably know the news, like what are you really learning from us that you didn't pick up at some other point? Like, uh, you know, we're we're not trying to be a news source. Right, and on top of that, uh, we are changing it so that we we don't want to feel like we have to play and talk about uh, video games all the time. Sometimes you get really into a video game, you want to play it for a month. You don't want to talk about it on four episodes in a row. You guys don't like to hear it. Like, I can't imagine that you guys want to hear us talk about something for four weeks in a row. If we're just saying, yeah, I still like it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, Persona 5, it's 100 hours, so I'm still playing Persona 5. (laughs) So, um, we're still a little bit nebulous. We'll probably iron down the exact format we want to use over the next few episodes. Um, but for now, things are going to be just a little bit more fast and loose. Uh, so we've got one uh, TV show and one game we want to talk about before we go into the comics. Uh, let's start with the TV. Uh, because we are now uh, four episodes into the new season of yeah. Venture Brothers. We actually are four episodes in. That's like at least a third. The probably. Im- the amount of things that have happened already this season boggles my mind, just four episodes in. I know, it's, uh, it's been pretty much firing on all cylinders, insane, wacky-doo, crazy pants, <laughs> as Hank would say. It is always wacky-doo, but uh, the way that they tie things together is just beautiful sometimes, <laughs> and the number of revelations that we've had, especially in the first two episodes. Yeah, and the humorous callbacks. <laughs> to all those things that we recognize. Yeah. Yeah, so the Blue Morpho plot has been seemingly uh, completely resolved at this point, both the identity <laughs> and fate of the previous Blue Morpho and the uh, final fate of the modern Blue Morpho, uh, Malcolm J. Monarch. Yeah. Or they... Malcolm the Monarch. Yeah. <laughs> That's his name. Malcolm the Monarch. <laughs> Malcolm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they, they, they tied that up real quickly. Uh, though we didn't get any Blue Morpho in the season premiere, except at the very end. I right. Mean, that was a very uh, Hank-centric episode. Yeah, Hank. Let's talk about Hank for a minute. I mean, I guess they kind of addressed it when they asked Hank if he's actually becoming a different person, or like, what the heck is going on? But I feel like it's so weird the way he just melts into other personas <laughs> whenever he puts on a costume. What is it? Enrique Matassa. Enrique right? Matassa. Matassa. That's what it is. Double uh, Hank. <laughs> double, double Hank. <laughs> and he also has a big hanky that he uses as a weapon. So Hank, I mean, at this point, is pretty much the best venture bro. For sure. That said, it seems at this point that they've all but confirmed that the venture brothers that the title of the show refers to <laughs> is not, in fact, Hank and Dean. Who aren't even the original Hank and Dean, so how could they be the Venture Brothers? No, the Venture Brothers appear to be uh, Dr. Thaddeus Venture and uh, Malcolm the Monarch. 
Yeah, maybe, but uh, they may not be the original Dr. Venture and uh, Monarch either. You mean like they may also be clones? Yeah. Oh, interesting. I never thought of that. That would be a very Venture Brothersian twist. I believe uh, I believe it's an internet theory, or I heard it from you in the past, where <laughs> in the Halloween episode, where Dean goes to the old man's house, yeah. and he talks about having helped create uh, oh, yeah. the clones for Hank and Dean, he uh, says some Latin, which translates to... Uh, <clears throat> He's discussing side effects that can happen from cloning, and he says some Latin words, uh, which translate uh, to, I believe, long, long eyebrows. eyebrows. And uh, whatever you call it when uh, you have, like, a, a growth that turns out to be your twin. Oh. A uh, undeveloped, uh, or a vestigial, a vestigial twin. A vestigial yes, twin. A vestigial That's twin. Good. That is it. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, that right there are even said. Okay, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you 100% on there. Yeah, so this was actually more of a confirmation of them being brothers than, like, a revelation. Yeah, because, man, Dr. Jonas Venture was a cad. That dude was the original Don Draper, man. Like, yeah, actually, he, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, he was just the worst and had this fiction built up around him of this amazing hero, which is double hilarious when we get into the comics, and we that issue of the Terrifics, which is basically oh, yeah. uh, Dr. Venture the comic. But, That's uh, true. Yeah, anything else interesting happening? I don't know if I love the weird little uh, love triangle they're about uh, to set up. I don't like it. I don't like it, they're, right? They're setting it up way too obviously, and it's like, why? Yeah. Why do that? I liked that she liked Hank. Yeah, that, that made, made a lot of sense. Yeah. It, it, it's weird. Like, I, I don't see what they might be doing with this that could end up with a lot of laughs, you know? Right, it seems more like a thing to move forward the plot, a plot device that maybe will lead to Evil Dean. Oh. And, uh... Right. Like, a, a flash forward, and it's... Yeah, Hank Venture versus Evil Dean. Right, if they're gonna be setting up a thing where, yeah, Dr. Venture and the Monarch are, uh brothers who are arching each other, are we going to be led down a path that has a uh, Dean arching Hank at some point in the future? <laughs> Only super scientists get arched, though, so the idea that Hank would be the good guy in the arch versus Archie... Uh, uh, well, other dudes are arched. Think of uh, Captain Sunshine. He's not a super scientist. Oh, that's very true. That's very yeah, true. There's other superheroes. It's just we only really see the super scientists. Which I, it's probably more common in that reality for super scientists to exist than those random people that actually have superpowers. It's pretty rare for actual superpowers to show up besides Captain Sunshine or the Brown Widow. Right. Usually you just get, like, purple guys right. and uh, people in gecko costumes. Uh, the Brown Widow thing is interesting to me because I almost wonder if they're poking fun at the rebooting Peter Parker back into high school when he was already an adult superhero for so many years. Because, ha- like, what the heck is he doing in college? Like, <laughs> that dude is in his 30s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, is there something happening? Like, or is, like, what, yeah, we'll have to see where that plot goes. And that could relate to where the Dean plot goes if he does start to venture toward down a super villainous path. Yeah, that's, that is true. But so far, the Brown Widow has been real weird. Yeah, just weird. And Nathan Fillion does a really good job uh, yeah. voicing him. He's always good. Yeah, we've been getting good Nathan Fillion, getting lots of good Clancy Brown as the, uh, what, what is he? Death something. Red Death? Yeah, Red Death. Red Death. Always funny, Red Death. His family, the revelation of like his little girl and his family life, like that's classic Venture Brothers right there. Oh, yeah. No, he's <coughs> hilarious. And when he does his speeches, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's just perfect. Yeah, so I have no real critiques of the season so far, other than that they haven't done anything funny, really, with uh, Hatred or Brock yet. Like, Brock's whole, like, my life is a lie thing is good for a chuckle. But, uh, you know, we haven't gotten any real good Brock yet. That's true, there has been an absence of Brock. And Hatred is, it's 100% seems like uh, we have this character around and we do not know what to do with him right now. Right. Situation. (laughs) 
They didn't know what to do with him last season. And, <laughs> yeah, that, that's continuing. Yeah, he needs to, like, nobly sacrifice himself for the family or something. That character is done. <laughs> yeah, like, he had some good seasons. Put him out to pasture. Yeah, he even got <laughs> to replace Brock for a time. Yeah. But now that Brock's back, hatred is uh, redundant. Yeah, and if Brock's going to be, like, all disillusioned with the OSI or something, maybe he would want to go back to just being the Ventures bodyguard. Right, because he definitely cares about the Ventures. Yeah, he's, like, their older brother at this point. Yeah. I mean, almost <laughs> surrogate father, except he hates that idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, he, when he pretends to give Dean the car. That's the best Brock moment of the season. <laughs> That's good. That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so far it's been good. It's been speeding a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think you're right. It's ten episodes, so we're more than a third of the way through already. And, Whoops. Uh, hopefully, uh, we... I, I don't remember if we're going to... No, it's Rick and Morty where they said they weren't going to take any more season-long breaks between seasons. So, Venture Brothers, you probably are going to have to clock another two years before uh, we get any more... Ah, it, it, it just comes and goes so fast. It really does. <laughs> and it's so good every time yeah. that you just have to go back. You have to wait. And it will come back one day. And I guess it does force you to rewatch it when you got a long break between seasons, so people are more likely to catch all the little things here and there. Yeah. You know? Tiny little things. Yeah, you don't have a new season to watch when you're buying the DVD of the last season, so you're really scrutinizing that DVD of the last season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? It's so good. Yeah, I mean, it's good. We know it's good. Yeah. Well, it's always we'll, good. We'll talk about more when another episode comes out. Yes, we can get more specific. Yeah. Definitely. All right, well, moving on from uh, television, uh, let's head into video games. Uh, video we're doing out of order. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we've both been playing the same game for the last month or so. Yeah. We, yeah, we have. We've, we've been playing uh, a whole lot of No Man's Sky. Next. Next. Update. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which uh, I was having a good old time on until they uh, really wrecked some stuff with the uh, patch yesterday. So there was a patch yesterday. I haven't been able to get on. I'm, uh, I, I'm apprehensive. It's uh, th some good things, uh, not to get into too nitty-gritty uh, specifics of the game, but the fact that you can do more with just your mouse in the uh, refiner screen is helpful. Um, but uh, the fact that you can't warp stuff to your high-capacity storage anymore from wherever is extremely, extremely annoying. And you definitely could do that uh, before, because... Oh, yeah, I was sending stuff to my high-capacity willy-nilly all the time from anywhere. Way your high-capacity in your backpack? No, my uh, big old crates back at base okay, that have yeah. five slots each. Okay, yeah, the crates. Yeah, I was always able to beam stuff back to those. Yeah, I, I only definitely remember being at them and needing to uh, <laughs> throw stuff from my freighter down. Uh, so, uh, anyway, No Man's Sky is a game. It's, uh, it's surprisingly simple but complex to describe. You're just exploring space. Just exploring space and finding out what's going on. Fig yeah, figuring out exactly what this space is and why there's these weird things in it. Yeah, I mean, it starts out, it just drops you right on a planet. Your character has a little brief about uh, no memory, better explore. All text, yeah, no voice acting. All text, no voice acting, which I'm fine with. Yep. And uh, after a little bit of learning how to survive on an alien planet, recharging your oxygen and uh, your hazard protection and whatnot. Because they give you the, a little gun, a little laser gun that lets you shoot at rocks to get the minerals out, and shoot at plants to get the carbon out, and shoot at animals to kill them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so... It's it, a nice device. It, it, the game has an excellent build-up. They uh, teach you everything you need to know as you lead, need to learn it. And it is a semi-complex game in terms of, like, the amount of things you have to remember. Like, this goes oh, here, yeah. that goes there. But they give it to you so piecemeal. Like, here's this. Here's how to do this thing. Oh, now you know how to do that. Now build a second one. Now you have to combine two things together. Now here's a spaceship. Right. Like, you, you got to find some extra things to put into that spaceship to fix it up. And now you're flying around in a spaceship. <laughs> and the fuels and, yeah, the recipes that you got to... Almost memorize. 
you do kind of, because there's so many bad recipes, like stuff that's not going to work if you try to combine it, that it can get really disheartening if you're really just clicking around trying to find something. Yeah, and you have to get uh, blueprints to really build anything in the game, and you get blueprints through all sorts of means. Yeah, it does. Uh, crazy. It does a good job of, uh, like, you can follow three different story paths at the beginning, essentially, but all three of them will lead you along a path that will you know, give you the blueprints you need, give you the materials you need to have in order yeah. to complete your build. Because the escalation in the game is excellent. Because, you know, you start out just a guy lost on a planet, and then you got a ship, and then you're up and you got a space station, and you're part of this galactic community. And then you go and find a big old freighter that's like a Star Destroyer thingy that you yeah. can you know, get them out of a, a jam and a firefight, and now they want to fight for you, so now you got a freighter you can fly around the galaxies and dispatch missions from. Yep. And now you're warping to all sorts of galaxies all over the place. And there's you can warp anywhere. Like It's a procedurally generated galaxy, so the options are almost limitless. I think it's something like 64 trillion, or whatever the next number wow. after trillions is. I believe, yeah, it's 64 quintillion uh, galaxies. Right. So, no, not galaxies. Stars? Yeah, star I systems. Star systems. Yeah. Which can have like two to six planets per star system. Yep. And uh, you can only get to some once you've built up uh, certain upgrades on your ship, so you're kind of uh, getting cooler and cooler stuff as you continue along the build paths. And yeah, better ships. It is, uh, it is a ridiculously addictive game. It's, it's so much fun. Like I've it's put so, so much time into it all of a sudden. It's crazy. Yeah, really. I'm at least, I've, I've at least put 70 hours in so far. And yeah, in that time, I feel like I've done so much. But as I play, it's always like, what was I doing? What do, what do I want to do next? What's my goal? I can't remember. I guess I'll just run around and mine some stuff and then go to my base and have some fun over there and build that up and then go to the space station, see if I can't pick up some missions. Yeah, like and if you, start, if you start picking up a lot of missions, your quest tree can start to get pretty, uh, pretty oppressive. That is true. Uh, but the fact that so many of the missions are redundant, like I can go pick up six missions at once that are all kill six creatures, and you kill six creatures and you've just fulfilled all those missions at once. And yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's a little exploitable. and uh, For sure. Yeah. But, I mean, there are so many different kinds of things that you can do that, you know, you can, do, you can exploit that until you get bored of that, and then you can just go and search for some alien buildings, uh, try to get a new gun. You know? Right run around uh, just uh, scanning animals, scanning all the plants. You get money for that. Yeah, I get a lot of money for that now with enough upgrades to my scanner. Yeah, and then on top of all that, the base building mechanics are actually pretty cool because it doesn't throw too much at you, but it gives you uh, some good options. I've uh, really gotten into that the last couple of days. Yep. Gotten the ability to build like a uh, domed buildings that I can plant stuff into, which is pretty cool. Oh, like greenhouses? Yeah, like greenhouses. I did terraform a little bit for the first time today where I was actually clearing out the area around my base with my mining gun in order to create a flatter plane so I could build out more of my giant open air laboratory. Oh yeah, that's a good idea, though I don't know how much of that stuff sticks. I, there's, uh, I, you know that grenade terrain modifier thing? I yeah. would accidentally be hitting that all the time when I was like canceling out of a conversation with somebody in my base. <laughs> so there's holes underneath almost all of the computer workstations at my base, and they are persistent. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, those holes have never been filled in. <laughs> <coughs> I think if you build something over it, then the terrain right. will restore. I, I believe that, yeah. for sure. But like holes out in the world where you don't have a base, I feel like that stuff just regenerates when you log out and log back in. Some of it does. If you cleared a resource deposit, those aren't regenerating for me. I, I, I don't know if I've ever gone back to a resource deposit, so I'd believe that. Yeah, well, I was dumb, and I cleared out all the ones near my base, so I couldn't then later lay down automatic miners. Right. And the other day you asked me if I'd built an oxygen recycler. Have you built one now? I don't have the blueprint <clears throat> for an uh, oxygen harvester. It g he gave it to me naturally as part of the main base building quest from the main guy. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like that quest bugged out for me a few too many times. A lot of the base building quests appear to have some weird bugs associated with them. Yeah. I'll have them asking me for the wrong thing, like all, they'll ask for me for one thing and then it turns in a different thing and the quest resolves and continues forward. Yep. And now the other thing we should talk about though is how it really is, in my opinion, the most Souls-like story 
of any game I've played <laughs> since Dark Souls, just in how obtuse the story is, like the amount of stuff you really need to figure out yourself just from dialogue. Like the game is never yeah. telling you, oh, this happened. It's all, oh, this person left a log that said, oh, I think th th there's this mysterious thing and I, I can't tell what it is. And you're running into like weird other alien robot things and uh, there's this giant artificial intelligence, the Atlas, that appears yeah. to somehow be in control of the robotic sentinels that are on every single planet in yeah. every star system. And uh, <coughs> may even be responsible for a lot of the creation of the universe since I went through the Atlas quest line all the way and through that quest line it had me uh, creating a seed where it would give me a blueprint and I'd be able to upgrade this seed. And eventually towards the end of that quest line I was able to turn that seed into a star seed and then fly it through a black hole to create a new star somewhere in the universe of No Man's Sky. Somewhere. Somewhere. I'll never find it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but still, it's cool. Yeah, no, um, I do know what the actual plot of the game is. I did uh, do a little bit of reading a couple of weeks ago. So you're pretty close. You're pretty close to exactly what is happening. Yeah. Yeah, Alice is definitely in charge. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it seems like uh, a lot of the NPC uh, aliens... Well, maybe not all of them, but uh, a few of them seem to know that they're not in control of themselves right. or that the, the universe is just a, a fake thing that's been created with everything inside of it. Right. Yeah, now did you finish the Artemis quest line? I uh, do not believe so, not yet. That's no. the one I have not finished. Okay. Oh, wait. No, I think I finished that one the other day. Yes, I did. I finished that one. It's the uh, it's the anomaly quest line I haven't finished. Okay, so let me ask you, what did you do with Artemis at the end? Oh, I stuck her in the anomaly. Okay. <laughs> and so now she's in there? Uh, yeah, she's in there. Okay. It's, it's pretty sad. <laughs> I chose to let her die. Yeah, that's uh, probably a, a very noble decision of <laughs> I was surprised because after I let it happen, I flew out and Apollo immediately called me and I assumed that he was going to be pissed, but he was like, no, no, you did the right thing. It's sad, but yeah. He told me the same thing. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, Apollo. I'm not sure. He always, he kept promising riches, but none of the stuff we ever did for him ever resulted in us getting much of anything. Yeah, nothing really panned out with him or Noel. Well, Noel is kind of key to the Atlas thing. Like, Null is the final answer to the question of what the Atlas is. Oh, really? Because of what... And Null uh, says it to you, I think, pretty early. Like, when Null tells you about what happens to it. That uh, it explored everything. Oh, yeah. And uh, came to the end of everything. And it, like, artificially extended its life to explore everything. Right. And when it got to the end of everything... Do you want me to just tell you? Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, when it got to the end of everything, uh, <coughs> the Atlas said... Oh, you think that you've conquered everything and flung Null into another one of the many parallel universes where nothing had been explored, and that's when Null realized that all this exploration was meaningless because <laughs> there was because there were so many alternate parallel galaxy realities. There's no way for like it was meaningless for somebody to try to explore everything because there was always going to be another one. Right. Wow. Yeah. Poor Null. <laughs> and now Null is cursed to be an everlasting artificial life form. Yeah, well, for me, probably Artemis, too. I spoke to right. her one more time after putting her in the machine uh, where, where she said she wanted me to triangulate the coordinates now because the stars aren't shifting anymore. Uh -huh. uh, to which I was just like, I'll try, but you better try and find a way out yourself as well. Uh -huh. And then it didn't give me any quest to try and set up a relay or anything because oh, there yeah. would be no point to that. So, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, Grim. Yeah, that's she's gonna be locked in a Sisyphean hell. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I could not resist. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, weird story for your our space exploring rock shooting game. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, it's, it's very fun. It's very addictive. <clears throat> the collecting is good. Just uh, exploring the planets is uh, its a fun experience. Yeah, traveling through hyperspace, figuring out where everything is, getting into little dogfights with random pirates. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a lot of layers to it. 
There really is. Yeah, and I mean, you know, there's multiplayer. You can be in the same world as somebody else if you want to be. There's not much you can do. Yeah, no. I was able to shoot you successfully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that worked. <laughs> and somebody came into my game and somehow put uh, right. millions of uh, credits worth right. of uh, items into my inventory without, yeah. like, me even being around him. It was just like... Hold on, I'm gonna make you a millionaire. Don't oh, leave. Oh man, I want a good Samaritan <laughs> to show up in my game like that. Yeah. So uh, thank you. I believe his name was uh, Jim Biggie. <laughs> so uh, his base showed up as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's base. So oh. I'm not sure. Well, maybe he named it that. <laughs> he probably did. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, we appreciate it. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, if you ever see... What's my name in there? Slick and Fly? Slick and Fly. If you ever see Slick and Fly in there, drop, drop him a load of, uh, <laughs> of expensive, valuable items. Oh, yeah. Maybe you'll get a shout-out again on the same podcast. If you're ever in our corner of the Euclid Galaxy, but not many people have ever been there before. I don't know. I was on Reddit earlier, and people were all like, yeah, I started in Euclid like everybody else. Well, everybody starts in Euclid, oh, just okay. not where we've been. Not our Euclid. No, or no, the Euclid, Euclid is the gen- no, You're saying Euclid is the entire galaxy. No, no, it's just right. It's the, not the. It's I keep the thinking entire, of it as the star system. No, nah, no, nah, it's the entire <laughs> galaxy that we're in right now. And they are running the community event this weekend. It started yesterday. Um, it's like a special mission that uh, Polo Specialist Polo gives you to go and find a portal on a planet you go through, and then you're on like a community planet. And uh, this is how you're going to be able to get that, like, gold currency that we haven't been able to get yet oh. in the game. Um, apparently you can buy uh, cosmetic stuff, like, like, stickers for your base and, like, <laughs> color stuff. And like, maybe all, I think it was alternate heads for the, like, nothing that was going to be useful in the game. Yeah. But, man, I popped into that planet for a minute and all the people, blah, 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 talking to each other. Whoa. Like, I couldn't even handle it and I popped right back out <laughs> I was like I'm not going to deal with like this number of people and nobody was actually rendering as a other person it was just a bunch of like fireflies going around uh, and then yeah. they, 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 with each what, other they're actually talking well at first I was like what they're just making gibberish noises and then I heard like a girl voice that was just like straight up like hey guys I'm over here like whoa so <laughs> I didn't like it I didn't like it at all yeah that's my, interesting my lonely private uh, galaxy suddenly felt like full of randos and I hated it yeah well, my <laughs> first instinct every time uh, some rando drops into my uh, solar system is alright I guess I'm just gonna pop out of the solar system I'm for cool. a little while <laughs> And warp away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that other people exist in this universe. That the that's a great feeling. But I, I don't want to interact with uh, them. <laughs> I don't want to meet them. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> kind of a lone space wanderer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so good time, good time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's if for I, sure. Yeah, we might check back in once or twice more with that if we get any good big revelations. Yeah. And crack the story and really talk about the nitty gritty. The nitty gritty. And uh, so, shall we uh, take a little break? Yeah, we can take a little break. Yeah, right, we'll be right back. And we are back. Uh, so, before we go into the comic reviews and uh, catch up a little bit, uh, let's uh, go ahead and rank three more characters. Yep, back to TV. Back to TV. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun this week, and we're going to talk about three Deep Space Nine characters, Yay. three Ferengi, Yay. and uh, so first, uh, let's start with uh, Quark's dear brother, Rom. Ah, Rom, the lovable village idiot. <laughs> yeah, and they feel so bad for him that they give him that, a hot girlfriend. Yeah, and then a, a really good job. And they make him a, a, an idiot savant. Right, yeah, exactly. He can uh, patch the hollow suit back together with like a spatula. <laughs> yes, that he, is one of the best. Because he knows the chemical composition is going to be appropriate for the kind of uh, thing he needs for in there. Yeah, he knows yeah. his stuff. He's just a bad Ferengi. Right, he's just a bad Ferengi. Yeah. And that probably held him back his whole life. Right. But luckily, yeah, he found the Bajoran militia. Yeah. Well, and Starfleet. Yeah. Well, does he, he ever put on a Starfleet uniform? He does not. Yeah, he's only ever part of station maintenance, right? He is. Yeah. So but he wears it's that. still Chief O'Brien who's given him his job. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Chief O'Brien is in charge. 
So, uh, yeah, I'd say Rom's a pretty likable character. Yeah, he's pretty good. He's got some good episodes, too. He's got some solid episodes, and he does end up as the Grand Nagus of the Frankie <laughs> Empire. Yes, he did. Uh, potentially ushering in an age of darkness and ruin for the Ferengi as they change their culture to be more Rom-like. Maybe. Uh, I mean, that is the most <laughs> likely of outcomes to that appointment. <coughs> However, the presence of uh, Starfleet so nearby, I mean, a, a new Ferengi under Rom is uh, much more likely to usher the Ferengi into Federation. The Federation, and thus more Federation Ferengi officers on your starship. And we, we've definitely seen Ferengis in uh, future jumps, at least in Next Gen, where there was like a Ferengi helmsman right. on the Enterprise. And we've seen Nog as a captain in the future. Oh yeah, we've seen that as well. Um, but, I mean, you think about the episode of DS9 where the Nagus was infected by the prophets and had become a good Samaritan, and he was going <laughs> to rewrite the rules of acquisition, and remember what that was going to do to Ferengi culture if that was allowed to happen? They could not allow that to happen. They went to the prophets and resolved that episode because they could not have the values of Ferengi changed from what they were because that's the way that society's always worked. Yes. So Rom's going to get thrown off of the top <laughs> of the Tower of Finance. I wasn't thinking about that. that that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That could definitely happen. Yeah. Poor guy. Anyway, uh, so, go. is Rom an above average character or a below average character? Mm, I mean, is he better than Janeway? I don't think I can put Rom over Janeway or, or Archer. Yeah, I can put him over. Or Jake I Sisko? Maybe above Jake Sisko. No, I'd put him under Jake Sisko. Q? Yeah, uh, I'd put him under Q. Alright, here we go, Dan. Sulu? Mm, I like him better than Sulu. Shran? I like him better than Shran. So he's gonna go right above Sulu, below Q. That's an interesting place. Rom. <laughs> <laughs> That's Rom. Next, we're going to move uh, on in the same family and talk about Rom's son, Nog, the first Ferengi in Starfleet. Nog. Jake's friend. Jake's friend, Nog. Yeah. Uh, he taught us about the Great Material Continuum. Yes, the Great Material Continuum. That weird bit of Ferengi religion or spirituality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that never really came back, did it? No, it's just in that one episode, but it is very, uh, yeah, it seems very pious. And they're just using it as an excuse to do that classic TV episode where you start with a one small thing and trade your way up to a big thing. Yeah, you know, Ra I mean, uh, Nog is usually involved in that because there's also the time he's doing that with Jake right, uh, for yeah. the playing card. And uh, Nog has uh, what is possibly one of the darkest episodes of DS9 with the uh, Vic Fontaine uh, post-traumatic stress disorder episode once he loses his leg. Yeah, that's true. That's a very good episode. They really use him to push that whole horror of war thing with, at the end of the Dominion War. Yeah, and it works because uh, he's young. Yeah, he's so gung-ho at first. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, when you have a horrible injury like that, and it really is a good exploration of the holodeck as how it could be abused by somebody with PTSD as a uh, way to, you know, escape reality. Yeah, another look. Yeah. Just like uh, they did with Barkley. Yeah, it's really the only other case of somebody having sort of another form of holodeck addiction, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and he's real entertaining when he's in the academy. <coughs> when he wants to be part of Red Squad. Because <laughs> they're so cool. Yeah, and he just thinks, oh my god, Captain Sisko is on the planet Earth, I gotta go tell him. Right, and he's uh, got uh, Sisko's dad's restaurant all set up to uh, give him the, the best tube grubs oh, yeah. on planet Earth. <laughs> Hanging out with the humans. Yeah, he grew up with the humans. So, uh, do we like Nog more or less than Rom? Um, I, I think I like Nog better. Okay. More than Q? 
Yeah, I'd say so. Archer? Nah, I don't think so. So, <laughs> we're going to put right above, what about Jake Sisko? Who do we like of that relationship? We like Jake better. Okay, so it's going to be, uh, it's funny that a Q is now in between Nog and Rom. <laughs> we think that Q is a little bit worse than Nog, but a little bit better than Rom. Does that yeah. sound about right? That's how character ranking should work, yeah. Uh, all right, I like it. Uh, that's number 33, for anybody interested. Um, so, last on the list is going to be the Grand Nagus of the Ferengi Empire, Zek. Zek. Yeah, Wallace Shawn, famous <laughs> character actor, yep. doing the Wallace Shawn voice to its like highest extreme. It's like you couldn't have written a character more for that guy's voice. And yeah, he's he, squeaky. And he always looks so gross. Like, they really used him to overplay just the really, really nasty aspects of the Ferengi. Yeah. Ferengi aging. You yeah. get so much ear hair. Ear hair and growths. And, and growths. Your ears are just sagging all over the place. Yeah, he looks like he's melting. He looks like he's melting all the time. <laughs> um, and it's uh, kind of just like Rom. He's one of those characters where at first you're like, oh, this is really annoying. But then over time, you slowly kind of really get to like his style because he's such a he's such a, a dick. Yeah. Like, but he's such like the perfect president for the Ferengi, in a way that like Gowron isn't like the perfect president for the Klingons. He's no, such a no. weird politician. You know, Dukat is a horrible uh, leader for the Cardassians, right. obviously. But Zek, the Ferengi have the right leadership. Like they got to <laughs> figure it out. Those that capitalist society figured it out somehow. Yeah, and he's good at his job. He's good at his That's job. Really, what what you're saying right there is, yeah, he is good at his job. He is uh, ruthless when it comes to profit, and he's always looking for new people to exploit. Yes. And that's yeah. very Ferengi. The ultimate Ferengi. Uh, so, I think that he is going to go a little bit lower than the other two guys we just ranked. Uh, yeah, he's, well, he's so, you know, he, he is what he is, but that's all he is. And he only works in one kind of episode. Yeah. Like, Rom and Nog both work in the funny and in the dramatic. Yeah, and they don't need Fork to be around. Right, not at all. Uh, but yeah, Zek, you're right, works best when uh, Quark is bouncing off of them. Yep. Uh, so, let's shoot down the list a little bit and go for a character who I think is kind of similar. Uh, Luoxana Troy. Oh. I think I like Luoxana a little better. Alright, so below Luoxana is Reginald Barkley. Oh, I, I definitely like Barkley better. Kern, son of Moog. Kern. That's interesting. Mm. I like I like Zach better, better, better than Kern. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, Kern. Yeah, man. Alright, so that is uh, coming in at the new number 49. Right, I'm just going to put in Grand Nagus. Oh, you got it. Zach. All right, so that was some character rankings. That was the character rankings. So, uh, we'll probably in the very near future do a special episode and uh, wind up some of the last holes on the list to fi finalize everything and maybe go through everything once and real quickly finalize that, you know, all the asterisk people are in the right place and why X really is better than Y. And uh, yeah. we'll, we'll have a, a little debate about it just between us. For fun. So moving on, uh, let's catch up on a month's worth of comics. All right, um, we have selected just the ones that we thought would be interesting to actually talk about, or uh, just noteworthy in some way. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about issue fifty-three of Batman. This uh, being the finale of the three-issue courtroom arc, uh, illustrated by Lee Weeks. Oh, this was the finale. This, yeah, I think it was the finale because the trial is over. Uh, this is not issue. guilty. Yeah. Yeah, they said not guilty. And, All right, uh, I remember now. And then he costumes up in the classic costume, the the, the old school <laughs> Batman, right. gray and the the trunks and everything. Right, he can't wear his new costume he anymore. He can't wear the suit he got dumped in. <laughs> um, this is mostly a uh, Bruce Wayne speech comic. The whole thing was his long speech about why he was doing what he was doing and why Batman wasn't perfect because religion isn't perfect. 
<laughs> essentially. And now, yeah. a lot of the internet blew up at this because they got the read that Batman was saying he was an atheist in this issue, which I didn't get from my read personally. Yeah, I thought like that he, he just, just like flat out say like he believes in God. I th- he pretty much does, and he he just kind of says that you know his faith was shook essentially. Right. But uh, yeah, no, I don't think it's as big a deal as everybody's making that out to be. But I gotta say, as much as I enjoyed the first two issues of this arc, I did not think that this was that great of an issue because, as you said, the whole issue is just a long speech about this point. And, I mean, why couldn't you have given us some of that speech over panels of Dick Grayson in the bat suit going around and fighting some crime? Like, oh, that would have been great. You know, give us something. Uh, but this was just a not interesting issue at all. I thought it was a very weak finale to this little short stint. I and, wouldn't uh, have to agree. Yeah, very unfortunate. And, uh, yeah, we're going to be moving on to an uh, arc where uh, that's, I guess, Batman and Nightwing heavy and uh well, that could be better it could be better i hope that it isn't just a lot of them talking yeah really because i mean you can see what he's talking about on page three yeah you don't need to need the rest of it to be about the same thing because then it's just long-winded and uh and frivolous yeah long-winded is right yeah. like this should have been the first third of an issue yeah besides really what this one does is just play out the obvious from last issue Mm -hmm. because you understood by the end of last issue why Bruce Wayne was was doing this this. (laughs) (laughs) and anybody who knows Batman understood it perfectly right at the end so this one yeah it's just talking yeah it was good setup and poor execution on the ending of this one and yeah. it ended up just being another issue of Batman instead of a cool ending to an arc. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> Very unfortunate. So I say we start to, what should we do? Should we do letter grades or should we do number grades for our comic reviews? <laughs> We're deciding uh, right now, live on air. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. Letter grades are funny, but I usually uh, default to number grades uh, for things. All right, I'm down. Uh, so what would you give... Uh, Batman issue 53. 53? I would give it a 3. A 3 out of 10? A 3 out of 10. I can't argue with that. 3 out of 10. Sorry, Batman 53. Sorry, indeed. <laughs> Alright, so next, and uh, we aren't sure if you read this one or not. Which no, I read this one. You did read this one, okay. No, it's just I read it weeks ago. <laughs> so, uh, I did pick up the first issue of Batman Kings of Fear. Uh, because it's illustrated by <laughs> Kelly Jones, who's one of my all-time favorite Batman artists. Uh, Batman's always looks, always looks super weird in the Kelly Jones comic. <laughs> yeah, as does the Joker. It's really a, a, a super classic and fun Joker look, uh, which is, is good considering all the shit he's doing in this issue. Yeah, it feels very much like a uh, late 80s comic. Uh, it's sort of real, it's gritty, it's down to earth, there's not a lot of over the top stuff happening, it's just Joker's getting Batman's attention literally just because that's what Joker does, yeah. and Batman shows up and knocks him out, and they do one of their classic uh, rides to Arkham with Joker, <laughs> actually in the cockpit with Batman, sometimes Batman locks him up in there, sometimes he puts him in the trunk, like in the Arkham games, <laughs> you know, sometimes he's yeah. got little pods, you know, it's, oh, it depends on what the writer wants to do. Um, but this issue, as good as it looked, and I do think it looked good, um, it's, I really hope that it's not going for this super played out, like, oh, Batman, you're responsible for the villains, you're just as culpable for their crimes, uh, just because you can knock them out and drag them back to the asylum doesn't absolve you from, you know, the damage that you've done, like, and I just, it's so played out, like, yeah. come on, go another way with it. Right. Hopefully they're setting it up to look that way uh, with like the female psychiatrist and the, her whole speech. Uh, that was in this issue, right? Yeah, that was her. Doing yeah. saying all the stuff I was yeah. saying. I, I'm hoping like that she turns out to be villainous in some way. Because yeah. that would be more fun. Part of the plan, right? Yeah. yeah this whole thing. Yeah, and but I gotta say, uh, the fact that next issue looks like it's gonna be some scarecrow nightmare fuel stuff drawn by Kelly Jones. I don't care what words are going to be in that, because Kelly Jones will draw some terrifying crap, man. Oh, man, scarecrow. Love a good scarecrow sequence. It can get real weird. 
So, uh, yeah, not much, too much to say. It's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll have to see where it goes. Yeah. Um, what, uh, let's see, I guess I'll go first on this one. Uh, I would assign this comic a six, slightly above average. I was thinking six as well. All right. So far, we're in perfect unison. Yeah. We'll see where we land on the next book. And speaking of Venture Brothers, issue seven of Terrifics. We finally get to uh, what was teased at the end of issue one, some Tom Strong action. Tom Strong. Great name. Tom Strong, man. He's, uh, I don't remember if Alan Moore created Tom Strong or just wrote what is considered the good Tom Strong comics, but, you know, he's, uh, he's Doc Savage, and uh, he's Jonas Venture. Yeah. You know, the, the fictional Jonas Venture, who's a true noble hero. The, right. uh, what's his name? Uh, Race Bannon from Johnny Quest, you know? Uh, good old it's, Race. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> he's got that cookie cutter. I'm a super strong action hero body, right? And the speech matches. Yeah, and the, even the way he talks, <laughs> yeah, it's so golden age comics because he yeah. just tells you his origin in conversation. And he's like, I was trained <laughs> like by doing this with these monks, and that's how I can do this. And my yeah. brain is just as smart. And, and that really is a Venture Bros thing too. They love doing that. Yeah, exactly, because that's, cla- that's Golden Age Comics, baby. And yeah. so, actually, no, I'm sorry, that's Silver Age Comics. Because I guess uh, uh, Doc Savage was technically Golden or even Bronze Age, but Venture Bros, with all that super science. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. They're mixing it up. I shouldn't get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> um, but uh, the, we're continuing the plot of the Terrifics, where Metamorpho is no longer Metamorpho, but he still is attached to the team, so he has to go on the adventures. Yeah. It's the, it's the classic <laughs> Ben Grimm is no longer the thing, and I'm sure at some point in this arc, he's going to have to make a decision to re-metamorpho himself to save the team. Yeah. I mean, they're fighting Until Doctor Doom. he gets Doom. depressed about it again. <laughs> right. He's, he's, that's gonna, he's gotta be depressed. That's his character, man. <laughs> and, uh, cause, yeah, this is such a Fantastic Four riff. Oh, what with, uh, the whole, uh, basically, yeah, what's his, Doctor Doom. I can't remember what he's called in this, but it's, yeah. it's Doctor Doom. It's, yeah, it's Doc Crimson? Doc Crimson. Is that, do- is it Doc Crimson? It's Doc Crimson somebody else, I think. Yeah, I think that's something else. God damn it. <laughs> Of course, but, uh, I would do that. Yeah, no, yeah. My name is me. No, no, damn, I'm never going to be able to find it. Vamp. Yeah. Vamp. Vamp. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, he is so obviously Dr. Doom that you can't look at him or even. Dr. Dread. Dr. Dread. <coughs> Everybody. He looks exactly like Dr. Doom, but he's red. <laughs> Dr. Dread. <laughs> I love um, the Jurafix. It, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, yeah, Dave, Dale Eagle Shea, Amazon Art this time, and uh, he's real good for the real bulky, you know, superhero looking superheroes. That that's what the man draws. I love them. I love the muscle man. We got some good uh, plastic man faces and things in this. Yeah, well, and at, at the start when you first see him, he's just like melting into his bed. Right. And it's hilarious. One thing that did bother me is part of Plastic Man in the cover seems to be coming from nowhere and going to nowhere. Um, where is it? It's right here. But this is his body going off. This is his this arm. Is his arm. Oh, you think it's his other arm? Yeah. Oh, that makes uh, sense. Yeah, that makes more sense. Bothered me because I, I always try to follow Plastic Man when he's doing that and make this sure is, all of his uh, pieces align. Isn't this probably his body? Somehow, the thicker white one. Oh uh, yeah, that's probably his body too. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> all over the damn place. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's why he's so fun to follow. All right. Well, speaking of fun, uh, I did pick up two. Oh wait, Raiden. Oh yes, thank you. We got to stick to our new format. Yes. All right, you go first. Oh, I go first. Well, I, I would actually give this issue a, a, a solid eight. Yep. All right, there we go. It's an eight. Mm-hmm. Highly above average, good art, story is continuing to crack. Like, it, it doesn't stop moving. Yeah, look forward to reading it every week. All right, so uh, I did pick up two of the uh, most recent DC Looney Tunes one-shots. I only thought this one was worth talking about. Uh, Joker Daffy Duck. Joker Daffy Duck. This is a weird comic. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I wasn't expecting it to 
be what it was. I wasn't expecting Daffy Duck to become a hench, henchman <laughs> for the Joker. Yeah. This top hench. Uh, Acme. This weirdly uh, well-drawn version of Daffy Duck. Yeah, he's uh, a little bit creepy yeah, the, in the way he's drawn. Yeah, the, the other one I got was the Lex Luthor Porky Pig, and uh, the Porky looked super horrifying throughout. Um, and it was not, uh, it was quite a lot worse than <laughs> Daffy in this. Because, you know, Joker, Joker already looks so cartoonish that seeing him next to Daffy is a little bit better than seeing, like, regular human extreme Lex Luthor and mm, yeah. uh, Porky Pig in, like, a business environment throughout the whole issue. Yeah, uh, this is the panel that really <laughs> creeped me out. It's the way where, where you see his full Daffy's full leg and foot, and he's like on his toes, like a like a cat. Right, and even though he has bird legs mostly, he also looks like he has human, yeah, skinny little human knees and calves that resolve into bird legs. It is yeah. it is terrifying. It is terrifying. Um, but yeah, and, he, and it's all written with Daffy Duck's. Uh, trademark lisp. Yes, yes, the lisp is all written in. You have to do it, and it really forces you to read it in his voice. Um, yeah, which uh, is weird. All the things he's <laughs> saying and doing, helping the Joker. Helping the Joker. I mean, I guess that is how it would play out in a cartoon uh, yeah, version. Until he mounts himself in the head and like bounces away, <laughs> dropping an anvil on the Joker. Yeah, the classic Daffy Duck. Yeah, I love that Daffy. Yeah. Where he was just uh, Bugs Bunny, but with more sass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the art was pretty good. I think it was Brett Booth uh, for the uh, main story, and you know he's okay. got that DC house style on lockdown. Yeah, um, uh, I enjoyed it. Um, but honestly, as interesting as the first story was, it was the backup story, uh, yep. which was done in the more cartoony style that I oh, enjoyed man. a bit more. It, yeah, and it, it just looked great throughout. It's Look, hilarious. Yeah, they didn't really go for the Batman the Animated Series look for the uh, Batman characters, which I think they've done in a lot of the other one-shots. Um, Makes sense. And, uh, yeah, the it, it is just a nice little uh, Daffy Duck kind of being the Joker psychiatrist and uh, interacting with all the characters in Arkham in a very Daffy Duck fashion. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good laughs. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's humorous. Alright, so uh, I think that we do have to rank it all as one thing. Agreed. So overall, I would have to give this a six. A six? Slightly above average, but I don't know if it's worth five bucks. That's fair. I was going to give it a seven. That's fine. But I can come down to six. We don't have to agree. You can <laughs> like it a little more than I did. Alright. Yeah, a seven. Yep. All right, but this comic's probably going to get a pretty high ranking because we read this one way weeks ago. But <laughs> yes, we did. I do remember everything that happened in this one because this is a good issue. Yeah, it was. Of Hawkman. 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 Hawkman fights a T Rex. Hawkman fights Hawkman a T Rex. Fights some uh, so, some birdmen. Right, like a bunch of birdmen, like a like a mythical trials worth of birdmen. Yeah. <laughs> He's fighting them uh, like until sundown. Right, exactly. It's one of those uh, extended prove your worth battles. That uh, yeah, and it takes uh, quite a few pages of the comic. Man, I forgot just how many pages are just the aerial battle. Yeah, which is funny because the whole time they're just like uh, squawking at him. With their weird language. Strang. Yeah. Strang. And he seems to have fought these guys before. Again, this is the first time either of us has ever read a Hawkman comic. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the real deal is there. Yeah, but uh, really. we, looks like we're uh, going to continue our little journey here because he gets to the uh, end of this particular quest line and ends up getting another random uh, time and space jump. Yeah, this is the one where he talks to the uh, the bird person Sage, right? Yeah, before the, he gets into the the ancient tomb that uh, has the ancient technology. Right. Once he defeats all of the flying birdmen, he talks to the old guy who's like, "We've awaited you. Do you have the bird-headed stick?" Right. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. And, and then he warps like, into the future. And he appears to be meeting a, another previous version of Hawkman, one of the ones that isn't a human at all, who's an actual Thanagarian, uh, Katara Hall. Katara um, Hall. So this is the past. This is. Probably the past. Okay, I thought this time he might have jumped into the future. Look, at, I don't know that I've ever seen a Hawkman with that wing variation again. 
never read Hawkman before. Right. Um, so this could very well be like somebody who's read Hawkman gets this page and is like, oh, I know exactly what era we're about to visit. Right. But uh, for us, yeah, this could be the future, it could be the past. They could be about to say that there's actually currently a Qatar Hall on Thanagar. Yeah. Uh, you know, who we'll see next issue. Yeah, you know, we which, will uh, find out. I think it might be next Wednesday since it was so long ago that this issue came out. Oh, nice. So, uh, yes, Hawkman continues to be uh, one of the high points of the DC universe. I kind of want to... Com- yeah. It's not quite as good as Venom, but I kind of want to compare it to that in terms of, like, just a, taking a character and doing a real solid thing with them that involves their mythology... And, uh, you know, it seems like it'd be good for new readers and uh, old. Yeah. Well, isn't that what should happen often? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's comics. That's good comics. That's all yeah, we ask for. Exactly. We, just, we want good arcs. We want good arcs. We want interesting adventure stories. We want characters going on quests and learning things about themselves and their mysterious pasts. Yeah. So, uh, what do you want to rank? Uh, I would give this one a... Probably another eight. Yeah, I think this is an eight. Yeah. I think that uh, well above average, well worth the cover price. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, good art, good action, good story. I, I'm all in on this. All right. Moving on. Moving on. So now that we are going to be cutting down on our reviews, we're going to have to decide how much we want to continue to read things that we're not enjoying as much and. Part of that may come down to if our audience wants to hear us talk about stuff we don't like as much as they like to hear us talk about stuff we like. Because yeah. next we're going to be talking about Action Comics number 1002 <laughs> by Brian Michael Bendis and Patrick Gleason. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis. And let me tell you something. Uh, Patrick Gleason is not the problem with this comic. Not at all. Dear what God, the dude is, he might be the best Superman artist of the decade. Just... He was uh, locked in on so much good stuff on Tomasi's run, and the way he draws the Man of Steel Even is, when it's Kent Clark, it's, it just looks awesome. Yeah, it's, it's almost Frank Quitely-esque, and it's the way he draws him is sort of like a big lovable oaf in yeah. Clark Kent mode. And then, yeah, when he has to fly up and uh, destroy a bunch of asteroids on their way to Earth, because I guess this is going to be Bendis' thing, is that Superman's going to be doing one thing, but then he's going to have to like break away from the conversation or break away from whatever he's doing for a minute to go solve some other problem real quick. Because this is like the third time that's happened. Uh, I thought he was like blowing off steam in this, in this particular instance. I, I, was, I didn't get the impression at all that these asteroids were a, a threat to Earth. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that's 100% could be a read on it. He does kind of just fly into the asteroid belt, doesn't he? Right, and that's right after that conversation about the people uh, start, starting the fires in order to... Uh, get Superman occupied so that they can do some illegal drug shipments and whatnot uh, right under his nose. Right, which, I mean, if this is really going to be the plot, come on. <laughs> like, yeah, it's so low level. Yeah, as much as I may cramp on the whole Rogel Czar plot happening in Superman right now, at least it's got, like, cosmic stakes. At least it's got interesting stuff happening. Well, we, we have gotten pretty, uh, pretty used to cosmic stakes. Uh, at this point, and yeah, we we need that uh, hard hitting thing, which is why he has Superman roll up for two pages and break a bunch of asteroids because Bendis was like, oh shit, I wrote a twenty four or twenty two page comic and I forgot to have any action happen in it with uh, Superman or anything. Uh, better better put in two pages. That, yeah. At least he does that for us. It's <laughs> more than we got in Batman. <laughs> very true. Very true. Small blessings. Uh, so, okay, I guess I get first ranking on this one. Uh, I give this comic a... It would be a three. I give it a four because it looks so good. Okay, I was going to give it a five. Okay. So that's what I'll give it. Fair enough, all right. I'm uh, pretty much, uh, yeah, pretty neutral on it. It's, uh, it looks good, and I can read it, but I'm not that interested. The, the plot just isn't gripping yet, and yeah. I don't know how much longer we want to give it to get gripping. And, you know, honestly, nothing even happened in this issue that I thought was particularly cringeworthy, like funny bad, or, like, oh. worth joking about. It's just, oh, a bunch of stuff happened. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the opposite of that is uh, Justice League issue 6 by Scott Snyder and uh, 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 right. yeah, Jorge this Jimenez. The continuation of the Joker is inside Martian Manhunter and Lex Luthor is inside of Superman. Right, which does lead to Batman and Lex Luthor du- duking it out at the subatomic level on Inside top of Superman's Superman. brain. 
uh, which winds up very badly for Batman. He gets like his legs broken in this issue. Yeah, it's, uh, it's grisly. Yeah, and the uh, Joker uses Martian Manhunter to like reach in oh, yeah. to where they're fighting through Superman's eyes. I don't like that. Yeah, that's uh, that's cringeworthy. Uh, that's why you're going through the eyes. You're the Joker going through the ears. Uh, Jorge Jimenez draws a real creepy Joker. I really kind of like his rendition of a lot of the characters. I mean, again, the art in this book, they're, you can't complain about it. It looks that's fantastic. True. Yeah, no, it's a creepy Joker. A uh, come over Joker is uh, how I'm thinking of him. Yeah, very much so. He's got, like, this creepy, stringy version of the mental illness haircut. Yep. <laughs> I, I love this panel, or a uh, half a page, of Superman throwing the Flashmobile with Jon Stewart inside. <laughs> uh, that's just some, that's classic old school, like, look at this nerd cred. Oh, yeah. And then he starts circling the Earth, like, nine times. And uh, I guess the big reveal at the end of the issue is that uh, you may not recognize this symbol, but nope. I know this giant white symbol that showed up on Earth as the symbol of the White Lantern Corps. Oh, the White Lantern. Yeah, the, which is the combination of all the good lantern colors, which I assume is still probably good enough to beat all of the negative emotional spectrum things that the bad guys have been using in this arc. The ultraviolet. Right, the ultraviolet and the, the slow force. Right. opposite of the speed Slow force, force. Uh, yeah all of this the, or the uh, still, still force, force. Yep. I always get that wrong I want to call it the slow force <laughs> <laughs> yeah still force makes no nah, it doesn't make more sense no it's it's uh, <laughs> I I don't love it or hate it it's just comics yeah yeah uh, so you're up on this one oh, I'm up on this one okay yeah I'd, I'd give this a seven it's, it's running strong, but it's uh, still just kind of a continuation in what's been going on in Justice League, which is so epic every time. It's a little haphazard. Like, there's so <laughs> many things happening, and it, even though it actually is pretty unified, it doesn't feel super unified. He's, like, moving at such breakneck pace with no actual character moments or trying to give you little character That's moments true. squeezed into the just the super high-stakes action. Like, it takes a lot of skill to balance that kind of super high-speed, high-octane action all the time that, like, Morrison did in his Justice League run back in the 90s, that, uh, where it was kind of the same thing, where it was always super high-stakes, slam-bang action, wow. something happening every issue, but he was right. so able to cram just such nice, pure character moments that made you say, hell yeah, like at least once per issue for some character. Or yeah. I would have two guys say something where it was just like, they just said two words, like Flash and Green Lantern talking to each other, but whatever they said to each other said a thousand words. It was like, <laughs> yes, these guys have done this before, yes, they, they're like amazing superheroes who do amazing things all the time, and they know it, That's and they true. trust each other implicitly to do amazing things. Right, this is uh, like, oh shit, freak out. <laughs> right. Help! Help! <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. What would you give it? Oh, did I not rank this? I'd give, uh, it, a, I'd give it a... I'd give it a... Give it a 6.5. Alright, 6.5 and a 7. Yeah, I, I, I would like it to be a little more... Just a little more better paced. Alright. Alright, so let's talk about this Venom comic first. This one first? Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, Venom, the first host, issue one, by Mike Costa, Mark Bagley. We are going back to the plot that Mark Bagley was doing in his <laughs> Venom run before Marvel uh, pushed him over so that Stegman and Cates could do their Venom thing. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad that he's going to get to continue. That's uh, pretty good. I like some uh, Mark Bagley Venom, man. Like, yeah. that, that dude and just draws Venom. Yeah, and I like all this, uh, this Kree symbiote stuff that's going on, and his symbiote costume <coughs> is totally different. Yep, and I'm into it. And that's great. I'm into the plot, like the, what, the way they're setting it up, and it's going to be a little uh, Kree, Skrull, uh, cosmic thing. I'm, yeah. I'm into it. I'm into it. Like, uh, I, I like the idea that this Kree guy is obviously some like super noble hero guy. Yeah, the fact that he's still around. Oh, man. Yeah, because like, the symbiote, especially with its current do-gooder attitude... Like, I mean, in this issue, they have him, like, really slaughter some bad guys yeah. badly. So, like, with the symbiote with a, wanting to... A smile on his face. Like, it almost seems like they uh, put in the scene right out of the Venom trailer at the end with him, uh, yeah, eating that's a guy's face in the convenience store. That, that's true. I didn't even think of that, but it's, it's, like, the exact same thing. Yeah. 
and uh, yeah, we're, uh, he's still Buzzcut Eddie, so I guess we're meant to take that this takes place in the past from where uh, the current Venom run is taking place. Right. And uh, yeah, if this Kree guy is truly like the super noble hero, why wouldn't the symbiote want to go back to this guy? It's true, and it looks like that might just be the case uh, based on the, the preview cover for the next episode. Yeah. Unless they give us some more flashback stuff and they show us some of the amazing adventures that they went on together. Uh, I hope we get a little of both. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, the symbiote itself being very conflicted because it loves Eddie. Well, but Space Hero. Let me tell you right now how this arc is ending. Space Hero's getting the baby. Oh. <laughs> My god, of course. Because <laughs> that's the other thing that's happening in this issue, that is, is that other thing. Eddie doesn't want, isn't going to want the baby to stay with Liz Allen at Oscorp or Roxxon. Or what, it's Roxxon, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Roxxon. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's going to happen. Makes sense. <coughs> well, cool. I look forward to seeing that happen. In five issues. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. All right, so saved kind of the best for last, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I can what, agree with that. What order do you want to hit these in? Uh, let's hit them in this order. All right, so uh, we're going to go with the newer one first, but it is a flashback. Uh, yep. It is the first Web of Venom one shot. Web uh, of Venom. Web of Venom. <laughs> because, yes, this takes place uh, in Vietnam. It's the backstory of the uh, symbiote soldiers that S.H.I.E.L.D. created by carving slices off of the Grendel, the, uh, the original symbiote. Yep, so you got a lot of old school Nick Fury, and who would show up? Want to tell him? It's Wolverine. Oh, yeah. This is a Wolverine comic, which I thought was pretty cool when I yeah. realized that's what was happening. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's awesome. Like I've been reading the some of those old Garth Ennis Punishers where you know Nick Fury would show up on occasion and oh, some yeah. stuff would be in Vietnam, and so I was right in the right mental state to be reading this comic at this time. And uh, yeah, we get some good uh, classic Marvel wartime action. Nick Fury's there. Oh, except he's a life model decoy, or what does Logan call it? Cowardice. Yes, <laughs> cowardice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know Logan is uh, totally. Invincible, so they really get to have some pretty cool slam bang action fights with all these crazed symbiote soldiers. Yeah. Now, am I reading this as correctly that those symbiotes took over Viet Cong guys? It doesn't seem like those were his guys that the symbiotes went to. He says that the symbiotes escaped from them, didn't he? Yeah, he did say that they got away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I bet they just took over some Viet Congs. So, yeah, and uh, this is basically the origin of the other guy who uh, we've met in the uh, other main Venom series, yep. the ex-Symbiote soldier, the last surviving uh, commander of that platoon. Yep. This, yeah, this is his origin story. We see how he ended up back in the uh, United States the way he is. Right, which we'll get more into in a minute. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, no real big revelations other than that. The uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. is kind of responsible for the Grendel symbiote being insane because they tortured the hell out of it to see if they could kill it. <laughs> yeah, which, uh, goddamn, that sucks. That sucks, and they're all connected by a hive mind, so he was driving all the individual ones insane while he did it. Right, which makes it seem like that's why... They were also wacko when we first ran into the symbiotes in Spider-Man. Right. So it's uh, it remains to be seen how much this will tie into the main Venom series in terms of the revelation that the Grendel has been driven insane. Right. Um, but we'll we'll see if it does. Yeah. Uh, so uh, is, am I first on this one? I think I am. Right. Uh, oh no, we forgot to rank first host. Oh, we forgot to rank first. So host. let's go back and rank Venom first host. Okay. So uh, you ranked Justice League first. Uh, yes, I did. So I'll give Venom the first toast a seven. Okay, I agree. All right, go you know, above average, and above average. Venom gets an extra point on everything. Yeah. All right, so you're first on Web of Venom. Web of Venom, I would also give a seven. I'd actually give this one an eight, personally. All right. All right, so last. Uh, this week we got issue five of the main Venom series by Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman. Yep. Oof, that's another good one, man. Yeah. That is another good one. Uh, the symbiote got a new power in this issue. Right. Yes, he did. He now has wings, yeah. which uh, is pretty cool. That's a pretty cool upgrade. Uh, it reminded me of, do you remember the old 
uh, one shot issue we had Venom versus Rune when they crossed over with the Malibu comics characters and like the winged vampire yep, guy got a symbiote. That. Yeah, that, that reminded me of this very much so. Um, yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, for so, sure. And it's a great visual. Um, and it seems like Miles is done at this point. Uh, Venom <laughs> drops him off and, uh, you know, beats it. Yep. Um, but honestly, I wouldn't mind if Miles continued to show up in this comic. Wouldn't I really think he's a all. good foil. Yeah. And, I mean, his red and black spider costume uh, really fits with the mood of uh, this Venom. Right, and his attack is even called Venom Blasts. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so uh, we do get the revelation that... Uh, in his attempt to reabsorb the symbiote, Null accidentally supercharged the Venom symbiote. So not only does he have new flight powers, but we can assume that he has just gotten to some sort of strength boost. Yeah, he's more powerful than he was. Yeah, it seems like he has more symbiote. If he now has enough to form these big wings, and then when he yeah. pulls them into himself, he still has the sort of carnage extra, like symbiote goo that's on his back so it seems right, like he's he... overflowing with symbiote <laughs> right now right which is funny because at the end of this issue well first we get the revelation that uh the guy who we thought was the last surviving member of the <laughs> crew he is the last surviving member but he, he he's just the symbiote he's, yeah the symbiote i guess he it absor- died and he the symbiote absorbed him it like physically absorbed him and became a new being that doesn't have to be attached to something else to survive like the most symbiotes do apparently right but uh, it does have the ability to join with others because it adds its strength to Venom's. Yeah, which and made me think immediately of uh, Dragon Ball Z with Piccolo and Nail. And yes. Like, I will help you. I will make you stronger. I, I thought Highlander, but yours is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I really like the basically carnaged out Venom. Like, it's... I, I, I'm down. Yeah. Like, it's... His super Ooh. curly uh, top uh, eyes, which is kind of like combining the big swirly red eye of the possessed symbiotes with the regular venom eyes. Yeah, going the opposite way of the movie. And uh, to last the paid revelation is that he realizes that besides his personal power up, he's going to be needing some added physical firepower to deal with the things he needs to deal with. So right. he's going to. Uh, that's fun to see. Just the cover of the next issue is, I mean. <laughs> That's all everything. Those tentacles holding all those guns. Right, just venom with a katana and a machine gun and a couple of bandoliers of ammo. Yeah. Just blasting through symbiotes. Like that's that's good comics, man. That's that's all I ever want. Yeah, that is what he's doing. He's that's just blasting through them. All right, so uh, I have to give issue five of Venom a nine. Yeah, this is the one I was going to give a nine. All right, so uh, I guess uh, this is the comic of the week for sure, though, isn't yeah, it? Or the month. All right, our comic of the month, indeed. Yeah, that was uh, at least three weeks. Yeah. All right, so uh, we got through them. That is it. Yeah, that concludes the lag cast. All right, so uh, thanks for tuning back in, everybody. Uh, sorry about the delay. Uh, we're going to try to get them back out weekly again. Yep. And uh, we're going to be trying to uh, get the ball rolling on our uh, special episodes in the near future. Yep. And uh, at some point, I will have all of our contact information written down. But I'm assuming that if you're listening at this point, you can uh, head back to one of our other episodes if you need to email us this week. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, so thanks for checking us out. Signing off. <laughs>